welcome to this uh, ICMI 20 uh, interview of Professor Dennis Hayes with myself, William Collins and Elizabeth Hobson. Now, Professor of Education Dennis Hayes has a CV too long to reiterate in full. He's the founder and director of the campaign group Academics for Academic Freedom. He coordinates the Education Forum for the Institute of Ideas and is well known for his educational journalism, including countless appearances on national and local TV and radio programmes. He's authored at least a dozen books, including in 2008 with Catherine Eccleston, The Dangerous Rise of Therapeutic Education. There it is. So, Professor Hayes, welcome. 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 Um, yeah. Can, can I kick off the questions then? Um, on that theme of the dangerous rise of therapeutic education, it was a book that caused quite a stir at the time. Can you tell us what you mean by therapeutic education uh, and why did, why did the book cause such a stir and why is it dangerous? You can define therapeutic education in one simple sentence. It's the emphasis on the emotions over the intellect. That's what it means. In every aspect of education and every sector of education, that has become the norm since we first wrote the book. I would say it, that emphasis on the emotions has now become institutionalized. And then that means it's just accepted. So you might say, what's wrong with it? You know, people mm. say, Everything's about the intellect and the emotion. You shouldn't separate them out. And normally when they say that, they're about to play down the intellect over the emotions. So people who argue for balance. But why is it dangerous? And at the, the simplest way of understanding is, is if you emphasize your emotions, you tend to look at yourself. So from kindergarten to retirement groups, everybody's looking at themselves rather than looking at the wider world. And we had a little motto for the book, Mark Taylor, and, and then a South London teacher, is now at the East London Science School, said, you know something's changed when children want to know more about themselves than the world. Mm. So you may say, fine, so people want to know about themselves. And the danger is it damages them because it takes them away from the study of educational subjects. So instead of learning about the world through geography, history, literature, art, they become obsessed in a narcissistic way with their own emotions and feelings. Mm -hmm. So we said it's two things. It's an attack on school subjects, which is, you know, people hate subjects. That's of the trade unions, everyone hates um, subjects. They all want to have themes and, um, and various replacements and emphasis on skill. When but you say also, everyone, you mean everyone in the educational, you know, arena rather than the public. The, the public, the public are being taught to want this. I, mean, I would say everybody, <laughs> teacher trainers, universities, schools, everyone, um, the unions all emphasise skills and um, various ways of learning because mm. it's often activity based. Then yeah, I must, I must admit the word skills is not a word that was ever used when I was at school. And yet when my boys went to school and they're mid thirties now, so this is a fair while ago, they would, they all talked about skills even at that time. So it was a weird, weird thing. Well, of course the shift of now is not to skills of the sort of things you might need for work, which is my, mm. traditionally it's a, when you're short of jobs, you start to say people need skills. That's tend to, again, blaming them for not having the skills rather than not being work. But now it's soft skills that are over. When you look at any discussions of skills, it's all soft skills. It's empathy, work, um, and work, being able to work in a team, being able to communicate. But to make my, my point about this um, the attack on the subject is dual, because it's not just an attack on the, um, the school subjects, but attack on you as a child or a student or an adult as a knowing subject, as a human subject. And that is where the danger comes in. So you replace knowing with feeling and then you can be manipulated. And the thing is, the most scary thing about the whole of the educationalists who are involved in this, it's very manipulative. Because when you start playing with children's emotions, 
Uh, it becomes almost something you wouldn't imagine in in the Stalinist Soviet Union. You know, that sort of things didn't happen. And we yeah. give lots and lots of examples. I mean, you know, and, and uh, the funny one from the book that we always give is um, a, a small um, child crying, mum and dad say, what's wrong with you? I don't want to go to school tomorrow. Why? And um, he said, well, it's my turn to put my worries in the worry box. And they said, well, well but I haven't got any worries. And so, <laughs> well, you're not allowed not to worry and you're not allowed to just feel. I mean, it is a manipulation of your emotions because the emotions you're not allowed to feel, of course, are the really good ones like anger, jealousy. I mean, I've been jealous of lots of things that really motivates me. You know, mm -hmm. anger about things. But you don't stop those emotions. Be empathetic, considerate. So you are playing with emotions as well. So that's very dangerous. But you're also... So we had a debate about this, it must have been before the book came out, and um, they'd set us up with a feminist speaker, and we thought um, we were going to have a debate about um, different sorts of knowledge. And she said something that I thought was really important. She said, before we can have a debate about different sorts of knowledge, whether male knowledge or female knowledge or whatever, we've got to challenge, take this issue up. And she said, what's happening now is people are being denied the possibility of an intellectual life. We denied the possibility of an intellectual life and it's that awful. is incredibly dangerous yeah. so and the thing about the all these activities like circle <coughs> time and um you know and uh, even you know for working in the in the woods now we get these things like forest schools all this is getting you know back to nature anything about your feelings and adjusting your mental health mm. means that you you never stop wanting more and more um reinforcing there's a, your feelings there's all this thing about self-esteem as well isn't there that um i mean that, that never featured in my education <laughs> you, you, you can time these things because when we wrote about it we tried to we first of all we responded to the, exactly that so in the early noughties self-esteem was the big issue you know everybody who got thrown off out of the big brother house or whatever said oh it's destroyed my self-esteem everybody was obsessed by self-esteem and then it became People said, well, that's a bit negative. Not, and then it's, the people started, well, talk about reliance and resilience. So make people more resilient. Mm -hmm. and then it became even cruder. Let's make people happy. Let's improve people's well-being. And of course, nowadays, it's improved everybody's mental health. So they're you're not doing a very good job of it are they i mean the common <laughs> mental disorders are soaring especially amongst mm -hmm. young people i mean one of yeah. one of the questions is going to ask is is therapeutic education responsible for the rise of common mental disorders in young people well I mean, i'm going to say yes i mean if, uh, part of the issue is if you emphasize emotions and you exaggerate the impact of your feelings so that you know, if you take a university example, you used to have um, Freshers' Week, but now it's often rebranded as, as Welcome Week. So you don't go and get challenged by various left-wing groups or pe people wanted to engage in things. It makes you feel comfortable because it's too stressful to leave home. And so the whole institutional thing means that you know, you, you're seen as vulnerable. And then, but the danger is, and I, I, once I wrote something about bullying a long time ago, and it, it was about in FE but I said no, the title no, was being bullied just grow up and then of course you realize if you keep telling people that they're bullied by emails and they're bullied by people asking them to do some work they then start to feel bullying bullied yeah. I think you see that with the mental health issue if, you know some people have said up to 70 percent of young people and, and children have got mental health issues that can't yeah. be true no <laughs> there's actually there's actually a wonderful um Jermaine Greer quote when she appealed to women to just feel less. Yeah. And I think, you know, that that's something that you um, you can learn. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've had my mental health problems um, as a result of trauma. And what got me out of it was firstly getting angry with myself, that taboo emotion, and then deciding to feel less. And yeah. now I'm all right. <laughs> and then I pursued intellectual pursuits. But when we first suggested, when we first came out, and people used to cry. I mean, we remember one instance about the damage we were doing to young people. There is a, a sort of emotional blackmail that oh, you're seeing yeah. that's callous. If you say to people, feel less. I mean, one of the things about the book that was really interesting, when the second edition came out with a new preface, um, we had 
Catherine and I thought about what had really changed. And of course, one thing that was obvious, because in 2016, um, one of the words of the year was, do you remember what it was, 2016? Everybody says Brexit, but there's a, another one. Um, oh, no. Snowflake. Snowflake, Snowflake. of course. So, but, and one of the things that I think we sort of got wrong, but when we the book first came out, people said, well, it's true about, about all these other things. You know, it's happening in primary school and perhaps secondary school. It'll never happen in universities because we'd written the therapeutic university and, and worried about it. And of course, the universities have become the not only center of, of emotional education but they spread it everywhere else mm. a lot of these things spread from university into the wider community you know petting zoos and trigger warnings the idea that you must have a safe space from ideas you know, and it's coming from universities and i just i go around and collect things i don't know if I put this one in the book but then if you as, as a sign of what's going wrong i went to the lse and there was a sign on the wall that said a course for students overcoming perfectionism and it said you, you might come to the LSE and you want to do really well you might want to go back to the if you come from another country and really achieve something and this may cause you distress you <laughs> might have to do a course to lower your wow. expectations and Oxford School for Girls I think it was had a similar program called the death of little Miss Perfect which was because the students wanted to do the best they could and they thought this oh, was awful. <laughs> <laughs> you can start to see how if that's happening at the top schools and yeah, top universities, yeah. uh, then it, it goes everywhere. And often it does come from you know, the first time I ever came across the idea of um, a therapy dog or a petting zoo. You know, they're from top universities. Harvard, I think Harvard Law School was the first school to um, introduce uh, a therapy dog because. If, you, if you're trying to be a lawyer at Harvard, you know, you might feel nervous and you have a dog with you to stroke. You know, what is that saying about human beings? You know, it's saying that you're pathetic and you can't cope. Mm. But of course, if you now say you can't cope, there's a lot of um, support for you. And that's the way you relate. People relate to the wider world. You know, I've seen it even, you know, if you're a police officer, you know, tooled up on the streets, you often present yourself as vulnerable. And that's how you do it. And is, so if you present yourself as vulnerable, and this, this is the twist to all this, is it makes you powerful. Matthew Paris wrote a very good article about it many years ago and said mm -hmm. that if you say that I'm a victim, how can you challenge anybody? Well, that, that's something I actually, I did a reading of um, a Peter Wright article only last night, and it's called Aggrieved Entitlement, which is a Michael Kimmel quote where he Kimmel uses it to suggest that men respond to the loss of their power and privilege in a changing world by being you know uh, angry and violent and whatever because of this aggrieved entitlement but Peter suggests that actually perhaps women respond to the loss of chivalry in the same way and he goes on to reference um, an Ernest Belfort Bax piece that he wrote at like you know the turn of the 1900s um where he talked about aggressive weakness and i think we've got a real aggressive weakness problem it, you know in our society today it really is if you can make a good case for being the weakest most victimized person then you are the most powerful person out there and it's That's kind right. of terrifying i mean it's i mean Julia Virtual calls it cry bullying as well in some areas. You know, that's how people think. Yeah. I'm about to be upset, you know, and if, so therefore you can't challenge me. And I'll just give you an example of how people learn this language. And um, somebody's telling me their students had gone for a tutorial. Uh, nothing normal, abnormal about that. But when they came out listening to people in the corridor, they said, um, Oh, that, that, it, that really damaged my mental health. So you learn to see even a difficult tutorial right, as something that damages your mental health. And you really, you know, you have to battle against it. I mean, I've, I've used that term snowflake to some of my students um, almost as a joke. So even at PhD tutorials now, we get students who come and say, um, by, the, by, by the, the staff, most of my students, they say, can I, have a, can I have a snowflake moment? So you have a snowflake moment, they tell you that the cat's died or whatever. <laughs> and then you get on with your, um, with the intellectual part of life. But it's too often that obsession, people just want to talk about their feelings all the time. And I think it comes through in, in public debates, um, that often debate is the matter of expressing your feelings. 
You know, you just yeah. express what you feel or talk about your personal experience. And just in, you know, in preparation of this, I was thinking, can I just go on to why I think there's a male issue in this? Yeah. Do you, do you, it's, I mean, I was thinking about my own experiences of debating and you have to, to be tough. And I was doing um, a discussion on free speech. At, at, um, I won't name the university in the north of England. Or, and um, we had four speakers. They were all men. But they, were, they weren't of one opinion. They had diverse opinions. They were all mm -hmm. experts. I was one of them. So the debate goes and it's a largely left-wing audience who are saying there's no challenges to free speech anybody can speak and then someone got up and said look at why should we listen basically to all these men right? and and i so and then you listen to the, the responses from the men on the panel and they all capitulated <laughs> they all started to say oh yes we've got to be more careful next year and i said don't don't be guilt stripped by this you know, they were they were saying there's no challenges to um, anybody speaking, but there is a challenge if you're white and you're male, we don't want to listen to you. And that was a couple of years ago, but now it's increasingly the case that no one wants to listen to you if you're white or male. And I think you know, there are other examples that um, you can listen. And one, I was just thinking on my own experience and other people's experiences that uh, ask people about this of just general informal debates, whether it's in a committee or whatever. And the one person that you, that is never wanted to be heard is often the man. So that if you're a woman and you speak, right, then you get listened to with respect. And if you try, and if you try to have a rhythm debate, then you're held to be too macho. But if that, ironically, that saying you're being too macho and having a debate um, and allows just women to have the voice. So they're mm -hmm. empowered by mm -hmm. silencing you. And people soon learn not to do it, even if it's only body language. You know, and you can just see that you're not supposed to say this. I'm not saying people being rude, I think people trying to have a debate. And, I, and it's the same for students because I had one student who wasn't at my university, another one came to me, and part of being involved in AFAF, we get students and staff from all over Britain and coming to us and talking about the issues that come up. And um, this um, student had been told off for putting forceful ideas. He ne he'd learned a lot about the topic and he's putting ideas forcefully in class. Been pulled aside by the tutor and told not to speak so much. Mm -hmm. And so the students learn not to speak. No. And so you just get um, discussions in class or in on panels that are just people listening to other people's experiences and feelings without any challenge. So I do think there is, um, you know, you can see it more blatantly now with the, uh, the attack on white privilege. But it is the case that if you're male, and it may be, obviously, and it's not just if you're male, but if you are male, mm. particularly if you're white, mm. you might not. And you know, I follow things on um, social media in the US where if you're Asian, the same thing happens to you. Male and Asian, mm. there's a real attack against Asian males. Yeah, they're becoming more white than the whites these days, aren't they? <laughs> and yeah, and this sort of it leads me into a question about mm. where this is coming from, because on the one level, you can think of it as coming from psychology, sociology, sort of coming up from the bottom up, if you like. But then, and I'm, I'm as resistant to conspiracy theories as anyone, but you have to ask yourself is there an organizing principle here is there a controlling hand here because i mean that example of the asians becoming more wiser than white i mean why would they uh, well because they're doing very well and it's almost as if anyone that's doing very well has to be pulled down uh, so what what do you think dennis is well, there it, just do you on that the report not out. conspiracy theory but is is there is there something coming down from the top whether it's you know government level or international level or what well let's go to the international level because um we did tr try to explain this and obviously books criticizing therapeutic education and therapy culture started in the late 90s and beyond and we thought well we looked into it and there's a clear thing that happens at the end of the cold war from 1989 mm -hmm. When everybody thought, you know, until that point, politics would be determined by whether you were pro 
Soviet Union, the alternative, the communist alternative, or you're defending capitalism. That disappeared completely. And there was a search for something to replace it. And people look for all sorts of different things. Remember, um, Francis Fukuyama wrote a book called The End of History? Yeah. The Last Man, because that ideological are gone. And um, it really comes with the Democrats in the US and the whole shift to, um, it spontaneously filled the gap. The therapeutic turn just happened spontaneously. So I always remember um, Clinton's great phrase was, I feel your pain. Uh, he was always saying that to you. I'm not going to do anything about it. I feel your pain. I empathize with you. And, and, and James Nolan reported on um, the Democratic Convention and said, like, it's a therapy group. So poli politicians and started to relate to people as, as I called it, um, giving therapy to victims, T2V. You know, therapy to victims became the new way you related to people. And that was spontaneous. Nobody planned it. It's just what else can you fill that gap with? You know, you've got all these mm. people they have problems. You haven't got any policies or any vision to, to offer them. So you give them therapy. And, yeah, and the, the, other, the other incident I point to in, in the 80s, which I've always thought was the start of this, was the miners' strike in 84, because I, that, de that depowered the entire working class male uh, union led movement. And it, uh, to my mind, it, yeah. it, it created a position where the unions and the Labour Party had all the infrastructure of power but their, their, their source of power and their source of moral legitimacy had been so emphatically crushed by Thatcher that they had to look around for something else. And so maybe that's part of it as well. I think that they did tap into it in the same way. If you, um, I mean, Thatcher was brought, I mean, the trade unions were brought back into discussions with Thatcher over education. And I think they soon saw that the way they now relate to their members is exactly the same. So you become, you know, been an active trade union still my life, and the first joint president of UCU, and you see that shift. So you, a membership of unions may be increasing, but it's a membership that consists of victims. And you, know, you can give lots and lots of examples. I give one in the book, I think, of um, when I was working at a previous university, we used to have, you know, any, you got known as the union person. So the, um, the porters who do the security work came to see us one day and um, they were saying that their shifts had been altered and that things were getting a bit difficult for them and what could we do about it? And I said, well, I knew the manager. And I said, well, let's go and see him right, and sort it out to so just have a discussion. And they said, no, no, we don't want to um, talk to him. We just want to know why he doesn't like us. And you just realise that, you know, you're just hopeless. And in those situations, you do, it's all about what people feel about you rather than anything else. And you know, it's easy. But the thing about um, victims, I always think is Marx makes the point that the French peasantry were like a sack of potatoes. You know, you couldn't really do anything with them. Or just, and that's what trade unions are like now. They're like a sack of victims. So, you know, you, you can't do anything with victims except offer them therapeutic courses, which, of course, the trade unions do all Well, the time. This, is, this is where I think, you know, is it a conspiracy tip? Because what this, what this, uh, what, what this therapeutism is doing and wokeism is doing, turning us all into victims, is making us all weak. It's making us all intellectually feeble and emotionally feeble. And that's exactly what you want if you want to control the populace, isn't it? Do you subscribe to well, that? It works. I think it's short term. It, it only works for a short time because what it essentially does, you know, people, when we, the book came out, people put headlines like, we're creating can't cope kids and all that. And mm. Can't cope adults are useless to politicians as well. You know, you can keep them like that for a while, but it's, it's not. And I was thinking of, you know, I was really depressed. I know one of the questions you, you, you said you might ask me was, um, are universities finished? And, yeah, um, go on, answer that well, one. Two yeah. years, well, <laughs> well I, know, I write about the McDonaldization of universities, you know. And, um, I know some people call it neoliberalism in universities, but the bureaucratization of universities stifle them. There's no doubt about that. They stifle creative thinking. And, um, and then you have something, the therapeutic overlay, if you like, the, the therapeutic university doesn't contradict that um, bureaucratization. It actually um, is complementary to it. 
So how do you get people to work within a bureaucratic structure? You give them therapy. I mean, I once taught on a teacher training program and I remember that it was all objectives. You know, you had to meet like 3000 objectives and produce evidence for them. And what struck me as strange was when you went into classes, they were all doing Carl Rogers hugging the students. You know, it's all, everybody was being really nice to one another and it's all small group work and literally, thank you, it's wonderful being with you. And I kept thinking, this is like subjection to the yoke. You, know, you do that sort of therapeutic thing and you work them through. And I thought, well, if it's going to go from bad to worse, and, and I had George Ritzer, who um, wrote the McDonaldization of society, over to Britain, and he said British universities were much more McDonaldized than any American universities. It's actually worse here. That's, you know, that's frightening. Mm. But about two years ago, I went to Warwick University to um, debate free speech, as I always go all over debating it. And at the end of the meeting, some students came and said they'd like to start a free speech society. They didn't want to be involved with the students' union. And I thought this is really, really good. Um, and then over two years, more and more students are setting up free speech societies. We've got a list yeah. of them yeah. on the AFAF website. Mm -hmm. So there was Liberate the Debate, which was several groups everywhere. And then there was um, the Exeter Free Speech Society. And then one girl in Oxford set up an Oxford Free Speech Society. And you know, people have contacted us about setting them up at their universities. Then there was um, Goldsmiths in Kent, coming from students. And that, it, that to me, mm. I mean, the students have decided they've had enough of being told what to think. I think that's what's happening. And um, I think that you know, gives me real hope. The downside, of course, it's the lecturers who are not defending the right to free speech. I mean, the, the recent elections for UCU, the University and College Union, I think over half the um, elected members signed a petition saying that um, free speech was a right wing and neo-fascist agenda and you weren't allowed to discuss things like trans rights or trans issues, not allowed to discuss them. So, you, you know, if you see that's what's happened to the trade unions, you know, we're not having any discussion. And I think to me, the telling moment was with the death this year of the, oh, the slaughter of Samuel Patey, you know, do I have to say who he was? <laughs> no, yeah, remind us. Yeah, well, I don't. Well, that is, is, well, you know, on the 16th of October, he was beheaded by an Islamist in Paris. He was a teacher of, um, oh, yeah. of geography. And he, he had, on a, on a session in his civics class on free speech, he'd shown the Charlie Hebdo cartoons to the class to show that the, Francis' uh, um, belief in free expression and he said to the Muslim students, you can leave or turn away, you don't have to see it. There was then a campaign to kill him and, and he was slaughtered on the streets. In France, Macron, and people criticise Macron because he isn't consistent on issues like free speech, but people made statements. Now, we would checked and not one British union, including UCU or anybody from any of the um, education union, that is, or any union, or one uni no university said anything about the murder. The exception was the National Education Union on their international website. They mentioned that he'd been killed and said it's very sad, but they didn't mention he'd been killed for free speech. So there's total silence. I mean, the Charlie Hebdo um, murders and other ones are forgotten fairly quickly. Mm. Um, this one has gone super speed. You know, the Je suis Samuel movement just disappeared and Je ne suis Samuel. People have just ignored it. And uh, to give students the due again, yesterday I discovered that, that a, a, a number of students at Oxford University have written to the Vice Chancellor asking her, Louise Richardson, is very good on free speech issues as it happens, to um, say something about the death of Samuel Patey and the need to defend free speech coming from students. So if there is anything to be optimistic about, it's that students have had enough. You know, they're coming through. Um, educational systems where Ofsted say to them, the ones, I mean, Ofsted are obsessed by safeguarding. You know, you must never feel offended. You must never feel upset. You must never be challenged. You know, and they come to university and of course they are challenged, intellectually challenged and they don't like it. And there are all those absurd examples where, I don't know if you've, you follow them, I the recent, uh, I don't want to listen to a lecture about the industrial revolution because my great, great, great grandfather was a minor 
and you know and to think of his suffering is more than i can and it goes on and on and you know people just say you're making it up but they're not making it up unfortunately these things are everywhere people find things to be offended about but i do think they feel really offended sometimes because they're being taught mm -hmm. that being offended is the worst thing and that's why you know, in 2006, where Roy Harris, who was the Emeritus Professor of Linguistics at Oxford, and I, we were writing articles called, he wrote one called, it's a brilliant piece actually, if you find it, um, Speaking Up for the Right to Speak Evil. And I'd done one, you can see where I was coming from. Here come the Touchy Feely Brigade. So there's all these things we could see that something was happening about free speech. And we had a long meal in Oxford, it was a great meal, as happened, but he was the founder of Integrationist Linguistics. And two and a half hours with Roy really hurt your brain. You know, you have to really, but we decided we'd write a statement of uh, academic freedom and try and get people to sign up to it. But the key point about it was we demanded a million view of free speech and you know, free speech, no ifs, no buts, whether or not it is deemed offensive was our clause. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was really prescient because increasingly, you know, and it, you, you keep thinking that it would not seem new to people but being offended is now the one reason going to get you in serious trouble no not be sorry be, being accused of being offensive is going to get you into trouble and um you know we do lots and lots of campaign work and perhaps one of the most difficult things about it is trade unions don't take up free speech issues um but we do and it takes up a lot of our time but a lot of them and this is our most worrying part is you're in a catch-22 situation because if some if you're going to be disciplined in a university for any any speech issues they have clauses that say you can't make it public or it's another disciplinary issue mm, gagging and clauses even, yeah it's a gagging clause and even if you get a settlement um then you know if you break this, that settlement you can be asked for the money back and costs or you can have your career destroyed as well. So a lot of academics just want these things to go away. Mm. And they can be very trivial things that get you um, suspended for gross misconduct. Yeah. Well, of course, having having uh, gagging clauses or making things secret is the way you protect uh, a system which would be unacceptable to most people had they did they know about it. And the fact courts are a bloody good example of that because <laughs> you can't speak about what goes on in those either um, well, that, just what, just coming oh. back to the therapeutic education thing well before i forget this question um boys famous and coming back to the men and boys issue boys famously are are doing worse and worse in education mm -hmm. it, is that a consequence of this uh, approach uh, and is it because the therapeutic approach is more in tune with the feminine than the masculine? I think it is. I mean, as I said before, that the emotions you're supposed to feel are those moments of empathy and concern and compassion. And I wouldn't say, I don't like the categorization. I think a lot of this, the um, mm. categorization of people into groups, including white male, is always a bit dubious because they're different groups of people. I do think it is, um, it's a general impact on the fact that if you stop teaching subjects, which you would see as hard subjects, you, know, you then um, create a climate where people don't feel they can do anything. So you wouldn't want to do masculine things. And I think in some sense, this is where perhaps knowledge is masculine. You know, you have to get away from mm. yourself and feelings. You know, it's a masculinity that I'd be up for. You know, people have said this, you know, I used to like, you know, powerful women. Who stood up uh, elizabeth here she's a powerful woman or that like claire fox people who stand up and will take on everybody but the condemnation of them is often that's too masculine so i do think it's um yeah. it's something we should encourage everybody to be yeah. i think it is the i don't think it you know my take on this i mean i've been involved as a trustee at the east london science school and i think what has happened in some of those white working class areas education has just disappeared but thinking back on that, one of the examples we had in um, one part of the UK where they still have grammar schools, and they, um, when we, I think it's in the book, is that the uh, grammar schools were still teaching knowledge. They were teaching Latin, Greek, sci all the separate sciences. And yet the, um, the, the non, what do you say, the, the, the comprehensive schools are still called, but they're not comprehensive. 
or the community schools are focusing on emotional education. Mm. So you think once you said the working class were thick, now you say, you know, they haven't got the right emotions. Anyway, that sort of thing. I think that is a, a real tendency. It's when you mentioned the um, the miners, because I gave a talk while the, just before the book came out in Scotland, and I was going to do something about therapeutic education. And I thought, God, you know, I'm, I'm in Glasgow. I'm going to be talking at the home of the Glasgow Kiss. You know, Glasgow Kiss, headbutt. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about therapeutic education. And then they <laughs> thought about what they were offering in mining areas. And guess what? yoga craft classes and so what was would you think macrame you know, for miners oh god well, yeah. we're, we're finished. Well, mindfulness for miners is more <laughs> that's the sort of you know the obsession with mindfulness is you no know, we couldn't predict it i mean we started thinking only about self-esteem but every new fad and fashion that comes along you know mm. is you know suddenly has a lot of take up mindfulness is absolutely everywhere in them is it perhaps just because it's easier you know it's easier to go down this route because you know physics and maths and latin it's it's hard stuff isn't it yeah. <laughs> why bother well that that's true i mean that is um that is the case you know and the, and the great power of therapeutic education is you're the one who knows more about your emotions than anybody else so that you know that's true but it's true if you've got a certain view of emotions it's actually not true we uh, i was writing i'm writing something about this now actually because um the traditional view of emotions was that emotions are like something inside you in a black box that nobody else knows about and um i think therapeutic education has brought this back the idea that we you can look inside yourself and find your emotions but often you can't do that because how you find your emotions traditionally and you will you'll all know this is by reading literature you know, you don't know what you feel about love till you've read Shakespeare. You know, if you read Shakespeare's sonnets, read, you know. I, mean, I always regret the lovely line, um, um, my, my true love, I can't remember, I'm misquoting now, my, my love swears she is full of truth. I do believe her, though I know she lies. You know, the subtlety of emotions and things that you get in literature, that's how you learn your emotions. And you, know, you can do it by um, you know, other people talking about you. I always yeah. give the example. And um, ma typical masculine stoicism is now presented as a uh, as a psychological pathology that has to be beaten out of men because it shouldn't be stoical. Well, stoical is just having emotions under proper control, and so you're in control of them and not the other way around, isn't it? But one of the difficult things, and I face this is um, as a trade unionist as well. Um, Often a lot of body organizations have women fronting them. There was a time where this was quite unique, but everywhere you go, you know, and I remember being in a situation where there was a senior um, university academic, a department meeting, and the trade union blocks would get up and start saying, oh, yeah, you're useless. and I could say to them afterwards, no, just a second. Nobody, as soon as you do that, nobody listens to you anymore. So tactically, you say to them, speak calmly, you know, be polite, be tactful. So the danger is, and it's just, it's like my be bullied, being bullied, just grow up. You know, it's a playground thing, you know, bus debates from the Beano. Um, you just, um, you have to find a new vocabulary, a new way around this rather than just by reasserting it. I mean, I think one of the issues that so we say you've got to counter therapeutic education by rebuilding a knowledge-based education. And, yeah. and one of the positive things we've put in the introduction, there are now lots of knowledge schools springing up and the knowledge schools hubs and people are networking right. and some state schools some are public schools some are free schools and there is a change you know in 2012 i had a meeting um, in london pimlico school sponsored it and we tried to get everybody we could from, from all around the country uh, who were in favor of knowledge-based education we had 90 and i remember Manira mercer who was then deputy um mayor of london gave a speech and she said a few years previously you wouldn't have got six people in the dog in a room to discuss oh, that, that's positive as well where, where do you stand mm. on uh, home education or homeschooling uh, i have been involved in it and um, in the past i was um, asked to be part of education otherwise and if it's got a good basis to it i think you know i can understand why people would do it now rather than send their children to some schools yeah, I mean, if my if my two boys were now of school age, 
I wouldn't want to put them through the state education system. I just wouldn't see it as a positive thing to do at all. Depends. You can select your schools, of course, with a bit of luck. You know, often you can't. And I think um, there's a real demand for um, knowledge-based schools. I mean, I think that is just interesting in itself. Schools where you go through the door and you've got quotes from Matthew Arnold, you know, to learn and propagate the best that has been known and thought. Mm-hmm. But it's a real battle, and one of the and it's a partly a trade union issue because we've tried to have debates. You know, when Michael Gove was hated, they did this thing about he talked about the blob of Toby, yes. so it was, and they called him Pob. So it's Pob versus the blob. But trying to get teachers to debate education, they just see it as an attack on them. You know, you're mm. insulting it. So, you know, so I think working your way through um, all these issues without coming out getting people coming over is really crass is difficult the hostility to debate is something that you know has led to a lot of formal debates so you know just in, in in my own university the vice chancellor is quite keen on debates we've decided that we're going to um well we decided before the pandemic hit us um and we're still doing face-to-face teaching by the way we decided to uh, sort of refocus and relaunch debate in every chance. So the first thing we're going to do is have a, a major debate for all staff, academics and non-academics, on what is a university for, and start having a discussion. Mm. You know, and mm. it's, it's, it's always a bit artificial. And Elizabeth will know because I think up salons, you know, in, in the image of the, the um, 18th century seems a bit odd, but you can only do it now. You have to do it slightly artificially to get people to come and debate. And perhaps one of the examples of it is book clubs. It struck me as very strange things. So people used to just read and discuss books. But now you have book clubs where people come together and read and discuss books. So I think you have to find ways in which you can um, have open debate and discussion. The, the real danger that I think you, um, that has arose over the last year, I think, uh, in relation to Black Lives Matter as well, is that anybody who dares say anything critical is likely to be cancelled. You know, the idea of whether cancel culture exists, you know, I know from our experience, it's not just the band list where we have, you know, lots and lots of, Elizabeth has appeared on the band list, at least <laughs> once, you know, again, I'm sure. <laughs> but, you know, you can just see that, you know, we've, it's hard to find out about a lot of the cases, and a lot of the cases we can't put up, but you know, there is an increasing tendency to, if you say something people disagree with, for them to, contact your employer through Twitter and a thousand yep. other ways and say you should be sacked. And yeah. all right, that doesn't happen often, but everybody else learns the lesson. In talking about teaching and men and boys, okay, one question I haven't asked, but it would be remiss not to ask it, is to raise the issue of male teachers because Whilst male teachers has always been a small minority in primary schools, uh, they used to be the majority in secondary schools. Um, and uh, every year there's fewer and fewer secondary school male teachers. I think there are only about one in three now, even in secondary schools. So what, what do you think is driving that? Is that related to the therapeutic thing or, or what? I think it's more le- um, related probably to safeguarding and the whole... Um, paedophile scares the fact that you know i'm not saying it's conscious but it's just that why would you go into schools i mean it's actually quite it may change of course with a recession as people um actually go back to schools but um and it isn't true in all schools of course i, th- I think um in some of the the free schools and in some in public schools that's still the case that you get a lot of male teachers but who would be a teacher i mean the difficulty mm. is you know if you, we have, um, you know, I, I, this is where you start to think, be careful what you say, you know, because uh, you know, often people who've come out of teacher training, the first thing that has to happen before they go into a school and do anything useful, if you're in a knowledge-based school, is they're not teacher training out of them, because they're told, you know, mostly it's therapeutic stuff. It's woke, both woke and therapeutic. You know, you, you've got to be inclusive. You've got to, you know, teach a lot of snake oil like learning styles I and mean, co-construction of learning all the stuff they get in teacher education nothing to do with knowledge I mean teacher education 20 years ago was philosophy psychology history of education and it was all based on on the subjects mm. and, you know, now there's none of that 
It's yeah. just, I mean, I, I couldn't possibly be a teacher. Despite being pedagogic by nature and having done A-level tuition, you know, in my own house, I couldn't possibly ever be a teacher. <laughs> no way. I couldn't face all that. It would be impossible. And one thing we haven't addressed, and uh, we've been going, for, I think, for nearly 45 minutes, so we'll probably have to accelerate this now, but we haven't really talked about academics for academic freedom. We, we've skirted around free speech, but society or organization is all about what it stands for what its membership is and so on uh, i mentioned that um we we set it up originally as a statement with roy harris in um, 2006 we wrote the statement and it really hit the headlines um hundreds of people joined it and um or signed up to the statement we had um, i remember the times higher had academics demand the right to offend because we never demanded the right to offend, just the right to say what we wanted to say, whether or not it offended you, but you know, that's the way it was. Look, it wasn't a demand for a legal right. It was just to bring us back to that state of John Stuart Mill, you know, free speech. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, we've changed. I mean, we're a very small organization, we're growing, but um, I have to mention this, I'm gonna put it on the website because people keep asking. We've got a core team, which is me as director, and we have, two lawyers working pro bono and a barrister working pro bono. Some of them brilliant ones, by the way. Um, then we have an events manager who's going to organise our conference and then four academics who do various things. So um, Mark, Mark runs the band list and, and so on. But that's the core team. We've, we've toyed with membership, but what we've set up is a network of what we call correspondents. So it's people who work at different universities around the world. In fact, we've got them in Mexico and um, Australia, who will just keep us informed about what's going on. And, and that's basically the core. And, and we eventually we'll put all their names up so they can be contacted. And the, the issue there is a legal one, of course, which comes in every issue. If, if they speak, it's on their own right and not as ours if we don't approve it because we don't know what people are going to say. And we live in a litigious environment. And, but most of our time is now taken up with, with people who contact us regularly about issues in their workplace. And often they'll be because some student has seen something they've seen on social media and then they put in a, a complaint. Or you get, you get complaints from various bodies. So you write something about um, any public organisation and somebody from there is likely to write and say, you shouldn't be allowed to say this to you, you know. So do you, do you keep an inventory of all these yeah, instances? We, we keep an in, One of the things that we'd like to do, and one of the issues we had is um, with the gagging clauses. So one of the person, there's one person, um, I can mention his name, Chris Hill, who was at the University of Central Lancashire, who we helped in a case. And um, he had a settlement and moved on to university and then retired, but he made his case public. So we have that case. And um, that was um, a very small issue where he um, had said, um, I'd rather have um, a centre for mathematics than a centre for multi-faith education. Gross misconduct. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, so do, do, you, do you advocate on behalf of people that are accused in this way? Is that part of what right. you Yeah, we, we give them advice and we take up the issues and... Um, it does take a lot of time, not just for the lawyers, but for our members as well. But what we did try to do, and we worked on this, I'm still working on it with journalists, was to get some of the people who were subject to gagging clauses to bring their cases into the public realm. Mm. And we did work for a long time with one newspaper, I won't mention which one, who, um, and we got them um, interviews with lots and lots of people, in different universities, different issues. Often the trivialest things can be classified as gross misconduct. And um, they wouldn't publish it because they, we didn't, well, they didn't want to be named. That's the issue. Yeah. Well, is there any relationship between your organisation and what, it, I think it's Jonathan Haidt in the States has going, I think he calls it the Unorthodox Academy. Or something. The Heterodox, heterodox Academy. Heterodox Academy. <laughs> That's right, yeah. heterodox well, Academy. We've got our friends um, that we set up. I mean, I'm on the advisory board of... Um, Toby Young's Free Speech Union, because he's, you know, he's got a, a good base of people there. Um, 
And we've got links with the National Association of Scholars and, and other organizations in Canada. But the Heterodox Academy was an, an experiment, really. We, it's not so much a campaigning group. Its idea was it was quite difficult to join. You had to present your CV and get approved. But that was the idea to, to set up an organization of people with different views. So, um, you know, it's sort of, um, it be interesting to see how it goes. But it, it sort of developed a few thousand members. But then if you're just there to be heterodox, where do you go from there? That's the issue because they have got organizations like FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which Jonathan and others are also involved with. But um, and in the work they do the campaign. Interestingly, FIRE started um, when um, one of its founding members was involved in what they call the Shadow University in exactly one of our cases where a student was accused of racism and it was all within the structures of the university. And he just went public on it. Something you can do much easier in America because of the First Amendment to the Constitution. Yeah. And, um, and that made it a big public issue. It's the famous water buffalo case um, which, where um, the student had some um, Afro-Caribbean black students were making a lot of noise and he said, um, stop making noise, you water buffaloes. And it went to him, he was Jewish and it was a Jewish expression. It went on, but it would have been, um, the, the, they make the point, the foundation, founding members of FIRE made the point that in many cases that would never have become public. Yeah. You'd have been disciplined and perhaps thrown yes. out of university. No one would know. And the difficulty with all these things is, you know, when you talk to people, they'll say to you, I don't want my case, because their futures depend on this. You, know, you can have your 15 minutes of fame and that's it. It's different, I mean, it's different for, for you and for journalists, I think. I mean, they can be cancelled, but they've still got their jobs. If you're cancelled in a university, it's not always the case. I mean, people get defended. You know, Selena Todd you know, was cancelled. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, it, many people have said to me, many in particular, that, um, you know, if, if I might have spoken out about domestic violence against men in, in my workplace when I was still employed. But people would say to me, it's all right for you, Rick, you're going to retire in a couple of years anyway. Whereas for younger people, they, they have to be more protective. Otherwise, you know, they can't pay the mortgage. So well, think, that's what, yeah. that, is, that is a thing why in the men's movement, you get a lot of retired men who've been fuming for years. And when they're retired, they can finally speak out. I, th I, th I, I don't accept that really. I mean, I, I get that as well, you know. People have said to me in the same years, it's all right if you're a professor, right? You can say these things. Well, that's not true for start. But also I always say that. <laughs> The thing is, I think you just have to say to people, I mean, I was, I was thinking the one message you need to get in other things is just speak up. You know, the more people who speak up, the less, it's, it's not difficult. Just say what you think, you know, no ifs, no buts. Say what you think. And then if more people did that, there wouldn't be an issue. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. it's no good, you know, just quiet. You know, you're going to make that situation worse. Yeah, I do think that the whole cancel culture woke brigade thing is a paper tiger and, you know, everybody's terrified of it. But I think that most people are actually pretty reasonable. And if we did all stand up and just say, no, we're not accepting this the paper I tiger, that, blow away. Yeah, that's right. I just, but it's hard to know um, if you take, um, we had... I've been battling on unconscious bias training at the university. Oh. We've got an agreement that all trying to get an agreement that all controversial issues will be resolved through debate and discussion or just because you, you if you have to do the training, you have to do it, but you don't have to do it in the way you must. This is what you must think. You, know, you can do it through debating the issues and what's behind it. And I think I just don't understand why people don't just defend their right to speak, speak up more. I mean, if people just defended their right to free speech then that would be a lot better than um, worrying about if I say something, you know, something may happen to me. I mean, I, but I, I, the irony of all this, I used to think that I was quite safe just arguing about free speech. You know, I don't actually say anything controversial like you. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I just say, oh, defend the right, I defend your right, to justice for men and boys, yes, free speech. Um, but, but now, of course, you can't do that because free speech itself is something that should be stopped. You know, there is that cancel culture about free speech. You know, things are not to be discussed anymore. So it's moving on to a new level. But it, it is true. I think 
if you're not in if you're not on Twitter and you're in the wider world, you know, it is easier to win the arguments. And I had a discussion a few a couple of years ago with some members of HR and um, about turfs. And they said, what are you talking about? And I had to try and explain what people called a turf. And so people just don't know, you know, in the real world, all this yes. stuff doesn't have any resonance with people. So I think, you know, you couldn't build a campaign. So we don't, I mean, that's a part of the issue. You know, all these comedians like um, Andrew Doyle and everybody who used to be really funny are now just campaigning against wokeness. Sometimes they're still funny, but they stop being comedians. They're sort of just being anti-woke. And I think it's it's an, a dead end, I think, because you need to get people engaged in debates. And I think that's the way, it's always debate is the way forward. And people will often say to me, well, well, what happens after debate? You know, because it's not what happens after debate. Debate to me is politics of the moment now. Because mm. we live in the climate where debate is not only unfashionable, it's it, it's suppressed. And you can't get anywhere unless you have debate. So I think no. the more we engage in debate, the more chance we have of changing things. So that would be my message to everybody, rather than just campaigning. You get a lot in America where people are sort of almost reify issues. I just read God, uh, God said it's a book on um, mm -hmm. you know, what the, it is, parasitic the, mind. the parasitic mind. And yeah. Think, it's overdoing it. You know, it isn't that we're like, there's an infectious disease that's going to conquer us. You know, it can be challenged, challenged through debate. I think seeing it infectious makes people feel fatalistic about it. I know he does say you've got to speak up, but, well, you know, there's this, it's, you're always being doomed. It's the same in the McDonaldization literature as well. It, it's almost an, in, an, an inevitable thing. It's an unstoppable machine that's going to kill critical thinking. And I think the, you know, that idea that we don't have agency and we can't actually deal with things can only come out through debate. And I do think that that's when it really arises. And I think I just need to be one example where I think issues having a debate really illuminate issues. Some students at the university at Derby set up a thing called Get Off the Fence, nothing to do with me, they just set it up. And they had debates. And one of the debates was, um, does dyslexia exist? And um, they had a student, a research student who'd been researching dyslexia and a panel of people mostly who'd had dyslexia or a bit experience of it. And the debate went, um, well, I had dyslexia and this happened and this happened. And then the researcher says, yes, but none of that works. Now, the research shows that, you know, templates over your letters don't work. And then the, the response is, oh, yes, but they seem to work for me. So the debate was knowledge versus personal experience. And personal experience sort of triumphs over debate. But the, the, having that debate clarified for me what's going on. You know, it's now the emphasis on your personal experience and your feelings, of course, over facts. But having the debates brings that to the fore. So people r raised it in the discussion. And I think, mm. you know, the more we have those sorts of debates, the more you know, debating dyslexia, of course, is a major issue in, in society because almost everybody's got it. If you, well, if you get tested, you will have it. That's just the way it goes. I think... Um, you know, that's the message we should put forward in all our platforms. Make sure there's lots of time for debate. So even now, you know, you think mm. um, we, you know, the battle of ideas model, you know, and, and Elizabeth experienced it, and I think you know, as well, is that you know you have short speeches and then lots of time for debate and discussion, and that does two things in the traditional million liberal sense. You allow you to express your ideas, but also have them challenged and other mm -hmm. people to express theirs. But it's only by having your ideas challenged that you even understand what you actually believe. Because you, oh, yeah. yeah. If you just repeat the mantras all the time, you, you might be wrong, but being challenged mm -hmm. really helps. So mm -hmm. that's why you give more time to the people who are engaging in debate as you do to the speakers. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you mentioned J.S. Mill earlier, and there's a, well, there's a great quote from J.S. Mill on just about everything, isn't there? But there is a good one on that. It's something like... Um, who knows his own views who doesn't understand the views of others and it's in mm. better language <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about it it's often um if you just repeat what you think is true you know you, you can just a parrot really you may not even understand what you believe unless you know you put it into the public realm and have a debate about it yeah that's another aspect of the cruelty of what's going on um with the denial of knowledge-based education you know um students go in believing you know if they go in believing radical left-wing things 
They are taught a load more radical left wing things and never taught any opposing ideas. And it's it's not fair to them. It doesn't give them, you know, a chance to formulate their responses when they go out into the outside world and find out that everyone isn't a radical leftist. And um, and it's really no wonder, especially with all the therapeutic stuff that's going on, that they just can't cope when they are exposed to these other ideas. And then you get the cancel culture. Yeah, I think yeah, it is true that um, the, the therapy culture is often used to impose a lot of social justice ideas you know, that you know, works. But students are, are aware of it. I think, you know, during the, Brexit was the key thing for me because a lot of our students come from Brexit families. I mean, the Brexit vote up here is 70%. But once they get into university, they learn very quickly that all the lecturers are Remainers. Not all. You know that when you suddenly they find out that you're not, they you see the response. So they learn very quickly that they get all these ideas imposed upon them from their lecturers, uncritically often, but they don't agree with them. So that's the idea is to sort of challenge that. And I think that's why I go back to those free speech societies. The more students themselves get involved in debates, the more they can free themselves and at least have time to challenge those ideas. Because it, is, it is the job of the youth to be rebellious after it all. It is indeed. <laughs> Well, traditionally it was. <laughs> I mean, well, it's that, from what you've been saying about, you know, the, the younger generation now, maybe they are still our, our ray of hope, because it yeah. seems to be the students versus the lecturers. So I know well, what I think, side I'm on. That, I'd like to, well, I'd be happy with that. I mean, the issue is, you know, the students are happy to challenge. I mean, sometimes they will say, you know, I'm not allowed to criticise. You'll soon know from the lectures, from the body, language and everything whether you're not allowed you know these are the truths we're going to tell you but you know that's not education in my view but i think you know I'm, I'm not, the more these groups continue and they are, they are expanding and I, th I do think it's it's interesting and brave of a lot of those students to set up these organizations and um, there are more individuals as well but i think that, of course they have to deal with the student union but sometimes by setting up those organizations the students union have to respond so i do think um, you know it'd be a, a really important thing to encourage it. Well, it's not for us to encourage it, because students will do it themselves. But if academics were at least involved in the bank, Talking about student, student unions, though, I mean, what I constantly hear is most, most students at universities don't really support what the NUS is doing, either locally or nationally. So why don't they set up their own alternative unions then in, in universities? Well, why would you set up a union? I mean... <laughs> They wouldn't set up a union, they wouldn't even have anything to do with the unions. I mean, there was a time where the University of Derby was quite famous for banning things. If you go, on, go down the ban list, and they banned blurred lives, they banned, um, uh, I think, they, uh, uh, who did they ban? I can't remember. Oh, they, I think they even banned the um, um, Farage, somebody, um, and, or Christian groups. They were banning all sorts of things. And I used to get outraged and go into the atrium and talk to the students and say, um, you know, they've just banned blurred lines. And they'd say, well, I don't know about that. Well, they've just banned this. <laughs> and then um, you know, nobody knows. And nobody, nobody's interested in what they're doing in their little world. It's all political ploys for them. But I think um, actually we got around that by having a discussion with the students' union about not patronizing their own members and seeing them as victims and things that people must be protected. And so they removed a lot of their no platforming issues. But I think it, it just takes time to challenge them that people aren't aware. So I don't think students, students unions are partly part of management now, but they're all not every committee because of the office for students, they've got to be involved in everything. Mm. So most students just take no notice of them whatsoever. So I think that's the, um, Sure. But, but why do you need a student union? I mean, <laughs> like me, old fashioned, I tend to think about these things, you know, let's have a sit-in, what's a sit-in, you know, it's not going to happen. I remember a couple of years ago, um, having a discussion with another group of students, not at Derby, and um, there was a strike, and they were saying, what do you do in a strike? Oh my goodness. <laughs> we were saying, well, when you, you go and lie down in the road, that's what you do, <laughs> block the cars coming. And they just, you know, it's, it's like I'm old fashioned and just think let's have a student rebellion. I just think, I mean, the, the best way for them to rebel is through debate. Let's have a look. Mm. You know, if they can get debates going, then that, you know, that's fairly, it seems safe. And it's actually the most challenging thing you can do because you can have you know, debates about lots of issues. 
you know, I mean, feminism being wrong, you know, a debate. You know, higher education, you know, the schools are full of people who declare themselves to be feminists. You know, is feminism good about, you know, do those sort of debates really need to have? I mean, you get, we get more time. There's a whole range of issues that you... Well, I think, I think um, Elizabeth took part in such a debate at Bath a couple of years ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My first. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, dear. I think that's probably the time to wind it up anyway, isn't it? Because we've been going well over yes. an hour. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. OK. So, uh, poor Anne, <laughs> we'll have to edit it down a bit. Because this, this yeah, will have right. to go go live about this time tomorrow, I think. Yeah, so, yeah. You'll have to Good get your skates it. on. <laughs> Good luck with the editing. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. And I hope we can have another conversation in the not-too-distant future, us three. For yeah, gender yeah, matters. absolutely. Because we mm. didn't exhaust all the questions. No. <laughs> let, let, let's have a debate. Let's have a debate. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great call. Right, yeah. yeah, that was excellent. Okay, thanks, everybody. Very Bye. Good, Dennis. Thanks, thanks very much. Bye. Thanks bye for bye. the time. Bye. bye. Yeah, I'll wait for my P45. <laughs> <laughs>